I love that the truth and wisdom in Scripture transcend time. And in a world that tries to redefine right and wrong, moral and immoral, God's Word stands as a constant. And the Bible is just as relevant today as it was when it was written. I also love that the Bible contains real stories about real people. I know that my own life experiences can be valuable learning aids, but it's equally true that the experiences of others can be valuable teachers as well. I love reading and learning from the experiences of those written about on the pages of Scripture. One of my favorite passages in the Bible is Matthew 5, 13 through 16. I learned Matthew 5, 16 as a young kid, uh, but the whole passage, one, it serves to uh, tell me who I am, but it also serves as a measuring rod for all my actions um, in life. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Well, this is week two in our series, The Book. And we are talking about this book, the Bible. Uh, my own journey with this book has been an interesting one. I grew up having never held a Bible, never heard the Bible or of the Bible. I didn't know any of the stories in the Bible. When I became a Christian, people said, well, you, I mean, you know the story of David and Goliath. Well, you know the story of this and that. And I'd be like, nope, nope, don't know that one. I, I didn't know the stories of the Bible. It just wasn't part of my upbringing. This isn't just stuff that you're born knowing. You learn what's in the book. And, and so today, we're, taking this, we're looking at this book, the book that we learned last week, the book that Jesus loves, and we're really asking the question, do we love the book? Are we going to love the book? And I want to begin by reading a short portion of a long psalm. And this is from Psalm 119, the longest chapter in the Bible, and kind of almost, almost in the very middle of the Bible, and just listen to the heart of the psalm in relationship to God's word, God's law, God's statutes, God's precepts, all those different words are talking about the book. When this psalm says your law, when it says your statutes, when it says your word, it's all talking about the book. So listen to God's word. Oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it all day long. Your commands are always with me, and they make me wiser than my enemies. I have more insight than all my teachers, for I meditate on your statutes. You know, the psalmist says, as smart as my teachers are, because I know your word, I'm actually smarter than they are. I have more understanding than the elders, for I obey your precepts. A young person who obeys God's word is wiser than an old person who doesn't. I have kept my feet from every evil path so that I might obey your word. I have not departed from your laws, for you yourself have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. I gain understanding from your precepts, therefore I hate every wrong path. That's just one little portion of Psalm 119. Psalm 119 actually is, is built in sections, and each one begins with a character from the Hebrew alphabet starting from the beginning to the end, it's sort of saying, this is the book from A to Z, or for a Hebrew, from beginning to end of the Hebrew alphabet. You know, this, this, is, this is God's word. This is God's truth. And, and I hope for you, my prayer for you, is that you would grow to love the book, to love God's word. Not just to own it, not just to know if somebody says, do you know where your Bible is? To go, oh yeah, uh, I can find that. I think it's in my, you know, in, in, in my closet here. I think it's in my car here. I think it's somewhere. But, but to know, not just to have a Bible or own a Bible, but to have God's Word in your heart. And the truth of the matter is there's lots and lots of Bibles. 
Uh, here's just a little sampling. You got, the, you got the giant family Bible. You've got the online uh, Bible, you know, kind of digital Bible and audio Bible. You've got children's Bibles. You've got study Bibles. You've got devotional Bibles. You've got a men's devotional Bible, women's devotional Bible. It's the same words of the Bible with different devotionals kind of, kind of built into it to, to stir our hearts. There's lots and lots of Bibles. And, and I want to just give you some information about this book that we're talking about for these four weeks because th this book is the Holy Spirit of God breathed truth. But you may not have really fully understand how much the Bible exists in the world out there. So here's a few things. There's around 100 million Bibles printed, 100 million Bibles printed every year. 25% of those Bibles are purchased in the U.S. Of purchased Bibles, 25% of the Bibles purchased in the United States. There are at least 2,100 languages that have the whole Bible or part of the Bible in their language. The Bible exists in 2,100 different languages. This book, the Bible, the book, is the world's best-selling book through all history. The Bible is the best-seller by multiple, multiple, multiple times. There's more than 168,000 Bibles that are sold or given to others in the U.S. every day either given for free, passed on to the next generation. Uh, we, at Shoreline, we give away a lot of Bibles at Shoreline. And so those people aren't buying them. We get them and give them to them. Now, here's something very interesting. 92% of Americans own at least one copy of the Bible. 92% of Americans in their home somewhere, they have a copy of the Bible. Two-thirds of people who have a Bible, regardless of their religious background, would say that the Bible holds the meaning of life. So two-thirds of the 92% of people who have a Bible would say, I think somewhere in this book, it, there's, there's the meaning of life. There's a sense that God is speaking through this book. Here's another interesting thing. The Bible has actually been excluded from book bestseller seller lists. Why do you think the Bible is excluded from most bestseller lists? And here's the answer. Because week after month, month after month, year after year, it would be the number one bestseller. So they just don't even put it on the list because it continues to sell that much and people read it that much. For, for the Star Trek geeks out there, there's even a Bible that's been translated into the fictional language of Klingon. There is a Klingon Bible. I haven't read it because... I'm not going to say why, because I haven't learned that language, and I'm not going to say why, but if, you're, if you've learned Klingon, God bless you. Uh, Isaiah 53.5 is the most shared Bible verse on the internet. They keep stats and all this. And here's Isaiah 53.5. But he, Jesus, this is prophecy, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And the punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. I mean, that, that, that is the most shared verse in all the Bible on the internet. A Gallup survey found that less than 50% of Americans can name the first book of the Bible. Less than 50% of Americans, and 92% of them have a Bible, and, and many of them feel like the meaning of life is found here, that, that you've got half of Americans who can't even tell you what the first book of the Bible is, Genesis. And what that's telling us is lots of people have Bibles, but what is it telling us? Many people don't open their Bibles, don't read the Bible. And then one last interesting stat. Only one in three Bible owners know that Jesus delivered the Sermon on the Mount. When asked who delivered the Sermon on the Mount, more people answered Billy Graham than answered Jesus. So, so we have lots of Bibles, and they're easy access. You can download a free Bible app with multiple translations that'll play. You can choose the text, and it'll read it to you with different readers. You can choose this reader or that reader. The Bible is so available. It's so accessible. Most people say the meaning of life can be found in this book, but they don't open it. And one of my greatest prayers, and I know for our whole Shoreline staff and our leadership team, for all those that are part of this church, and maybe for those of you that are searching and seeking, trying to figure out the whole Jesus thing and the whole Bible thing, and one of our greatest prayers is that you would, get, you would engage with the Word of God 
and let the word of God speak to your heart and teach you and grow you and transform you. That we wouldn't just have a Bible or own a Bible. At the end of the service again today, I'm going to remind you that if you want a Bible, you can just, you can just text the word Bible to the number that we're going to share with you at that point and, and you will be able to get a Bible. But we don't want to just give you a Bible to put on a shelf somewhere. This book has power, but it changes our lives when we open it up and when we read it. So here's my question for you. Do you love the Bible? Do you love this book? Do you love the book? Listen to these words from Psalm 119, verse 97. The psalmist says, Oh, how I love your law, the law of God, the word of God. Oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it all day long. This, this book is in my mind. It's in my heart. I long for it. I love it because it transforms my life. I want to challenge you today to open yourself to, in a new way, fall in love with the Word of God. And to do that, I want to think about this idea of, you know, how do we treat things that we love? I mean, how do you treat something that you really love? Because there's a way we treat things when we love them. There's a way we honor them and pamper them. And if you say, I love this, we expect some things. We can even love something so much that we go over the top. For instance, when somebody says, I love my dog, that means certain things. But imagine somebody who says, I love my dog so much that I actually take them to a private salon where a team of people do this. Take a look. You know, I love my dog so much, there's a whole team. I can tell you right now as, as a pastor, and I probably don't have to tell you this, I don't spend that much time and money on my hair. But some people are like, man, I love my dog, so I pamper them. Or somebody says to you, you know, I love Star Wars. I mean, I am a Star Wars geek. As a matter of fact, I have a whole room at my house that's all Star Wars stuff. You say, really? Come on and see it. And you walk in and you go, uh, you do love Star Wars. I mean, you love Star Wars to the point of being, woo, you're out there. But when we love something, you know, we kind of get lavish. Maybe a person says, you know, I love to pamper myself. I love me, and I love to pamper myself with snacks, with food. As a matter of fact, when I get home tonight, it's going to look something like this. And you go, I love me. I'm going to care for, I'm going to pamper me. I'm going to take care of me. There's lots of things that when we say we love them, you can look and say, man, you do. But when you look at somebody who says they love Jesus, who says they're a follower of Jesus Christ, and they say, I love Jesus, I hope they also say, I love his word. And so there's some things uh, that, that there, there's probably reasons why we don't treat the Bible like we love it. Let me give you five reasons, and we're going to kind of just going to kind of walk through these quickly, but here's five reasons that, that maybe we don't treat the book as if we love it. Here's number one. The number one reason I don't treat the Bible as if I love it, because I'm too busy or I'm too lazy. He said, oh, I, I love the Bible, and I, I love God's Word, I love His truth, but you don't live like it. You don't engage with it. You don't know what it says. You don't, don't pour it into your heart and your mind on a regular business, a uh, re regular basis. And maybe the reason is just, you know, you say, I'm just so busy. I don't have time. But I would encourage you, if you feel too busy to open this book, that you would ask, what do I really do with my time? Okay, I might work so many hours. I might do this so many hours. But how much discretionary time do I have? And we, we live in a media-saturated world. We have access on all kinds of devices to entertainment with no end. And what if we were just to say, listen, if I just blocked out 10 minutes, 15 minutes a day and opened up the book, man, I would start to look like I love it. But sometimes our busyness or a lack of discipline keep us from digging into God's Word. Here's a second reason that some people don't treat the book as if they love it. And that's if they read it the wrong way. You know, some people read the Bible, and, and, and they're not reading it the way God intended it to be read. The Bible is a book from the heart of God to our minds and our hearts to transform our lives. The, the, the Bible, some people treat the Bible as if it's, it's just sort of something that dropped out of the sky today. Well, we have to understand the context. If you don't know the context, the historical context, the background, where it was spoken, what the world was like, then it may not make sense, and you're going to act like you don't love it because you don't engage with it. We have to understand context. We have to understand that this is not a textbook. The Bible is not a school textbook. If you, if you have a parent who says to a child who misbehaves, if you keep misbehaving, I'm going to make you memorize Bible verses. What, you're, 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 I'm going to punish you with study? 
No, we have to love God's word and pass that love on to the next generation. It's not a textbook. Let me tell you what else the Bible is not. The Bible is not a hammer, and the person you disagree with is the nail. Pound, pound. That's not the Bible. And if we treat the Bible like that, we start wondering what this is all about. We have to understand that the Bible is God's truth, not my subjective truth. It's God's truth from beginning to end. And when we know it's his truth, and we know it's not meant to beat people up, and we know it's not meant to be a chore or a textbook, but it's meant to, to be an encounter with a living God by the Spirit of God breathing through it and touching our hearts and our lives. We draw near to God and open up his word because we say, God, you're going to say something. You're going to do something. You're going to teach me something. And I want it. I hunger to encounter you. I hunger to learn your will for my life and to receive the power to live it out. There's other reasons that people don't treat the book as if they love it. Another one is that they don't understand it. Some people say, I just don't understand it. I've had a lot of people say, I just don't understand the Bible. And I'll usually tell them, then get a study Bible. A study Bible has, has the text of the Bible, and at the bottom it has study notes that say, here's the background, here's the language background, here's the history, here's the contextual background, and all of a sudden it makes sense. The first Bible I ever got was given to me when I was 15, almost 16 years old. And it was a study Bible, so it was about twice as thick as this. I'd never held such a thick book in my hands in my whole life. But the, one of the youth leaders bought me a Bible with his own money and gave it to me. And he said, this is the Bible from beginning to end, and all the big print part is the Bible, but he said at the bottom, all the study notes, it was called the Harper Study Bible, all the study notes, he says, that's giving you this background. And, and so when I read through the Bible the first time, I read the whole Bible, but I also read the little notes at the bottom. So I'd read something, I'd go, that doesn't make any sense. Then I'd be down there, oh, that's what a cubit is. It's a, it's, a, it's a measurement, it's a length of measurement. But I didn't know, oh, the answer. And almost every time I'd read something in my Bible that didn't make sense, I'd go, I looked down at the little words below, and I'd go, oh, I get it now, and i keep on going. Some people treat the Bible like it, they don't love it because they don't get it. So if that's you, think about getting a basic study Bible. An NIV, New International Version Study Bible would be a great gift to get yourself for your next birthday, for Christmas. Buy it this week and then count it as your next Christmas or birthday gift or something. But, but get a good study Bible. If you don't understand it, it's hard to love it. Another reason that people treat the Bible, or the book, like they don't love it is they get too convicted. Some people will pick up this book and start reading it. And they'll read a passage and they'll realize oh, I'm living in immorality and God wants me to stop. I don't want to read this book anymore because I don't want to change. Some people read this book and they go, I got an anger issue and it's, it's, it's destroying me and this book is challenging me. I'm reading Proverbs and it talks about a hot head and somebody loses their temper and it convicts me and we act like we don't like the Bible because I don't want to hear what it has to say. So we kind of push it aside. Don't stop loving and reading the Bible just because it convicts you. Let the Spirit of God convict you through the Word of God and change. And your life will get better and better and better. When there's conviction, don't run from the Bible or push it aside. Welcome God's Spirit to challenge your heart. And then the fifth reason that some people don't treat the book as if they love it is they don't realize the power of the book. They just don't understand the incredible Holy Spirit-given, God-given power of this, of this divinely breathed Word of God. One of my favorite passages in the Bible, one of the first passages I committed to memory is 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All Scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God, you and I, may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. I mean, listen to these words. What does God's word do? It teaches us. We need to know how to live, how to love, how to think, how to relate, how to be married, how to be single, how to be in, in the workplace, how to be whatever. We need to learn, and the Bible teaches. It rebukes. There's times where the Bible says, and you know what? That's wrong. And it gives us a spiritual wake-up call. You shouldn't be living that way. So it rebukes us, but then it corrects us. So the Bible both rebukes and says that's wrong, and then it corrects, but here's the right way to live. So it's teaching, it's rebuking, it's correcting, it's training in righteousness. It's, it's, a, it's like a tool to have a spiritual workout. And just like if you want to get in good shape physically, you work out every day. If you want to get in good shape spiritually, you open this book every day. And God trains you, and then it equips you 
for ministry, to love others, to be a good employee, to be a good employer, to be a good friend, to be a good spouse, to be a good parent. It, it, it prepares you and equips you for all that God wants you to do, to be a light in the world. You're saying that this, this one book can teach, repuke, correct, train, and equip? Yes. And here's one of the fun things about the Bible. Every day you pick it up and open it up and read it, you don't know what God's going to do. I get excited every time I read the Bible because I said, God's going to do something. And then I read it and I go, oh, it's a conviction day. And I get kind of spiritually challenged by God or just convicted to the core of my heart. Man, my attitude's wrong. My motives are wrong. My behavior's wrong. And there's conviction. You know, I need that sometimes. And so do you. And sometimes I'll read it and, and it equips me and I feel more ready to be a husband, ready to be a dad or a grandpa. I feel more ready to be a pastor and, and serve the church. But God's word does something every time we open it. In the same way that eating a good meal gives you physical strength every time you eat it. But our lives aren't like, and I'll date myself here, an old cartoon called Popeye. Uh, it, you know, Popeye would eat spinach, this cartoon character would eat spinach, and all of a sudden he'd big muscles and he'd be strong the moment he ate it. Spinach doesn't really work that way except over time, and the Bible doesn't work that way except over time. Feast on the Bible, feed on the Bible, fill your soul with the Bible, fill your mind with the Bible, and after days and weeks and months, the spiritual strength comes. So be consistent and persistent and don't give up on digging in to God's Word. And there's also not only kind of things that indicate that maybe we aren't living as if we love the Bible, but also reasons to love and learn from the book. I, I want you just to listen and hear some reasons why you should love this book and want to learn from this book every day for the rest of your life. There's some good reasons that I hope will inspire you. So here's my prayer. As I share these reasons and some scriptures, I pray the Holy Spirit in your heart begins to just say to you, listen, fall in love with the word. Read it more than you ever have before. Respond more than you ever have before. There's reasons to love and learn from this book. Here's the first one. It points me to the one who loves me most. This book, in a way that nothing else can, this book points us to the God who loves you and who loves me. And we need to see that God, the face of that God. We need to be reminded that we are loved and we are precious in his sight. One of the most well-known verses in the Bible is John 3.16. I'm going to read 3.16 and the next verse, verse 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. This book tells us about a God who so loves you and so loves me that he sent his one and only son from the glory of heaven. And Jesus willingly came to give his life, to die, to bear our sin, to bury it, and then to rise again in glory. That's love. I wouldn't know about the love of God, and neither would you, if you didn't know it from the Bible. You say, well, I didn't learn it first from the Bible. I learned it from my grandma. Yeah, but you know where she learned it? From the Bible, from the book. Well, I learned from a Sunday school teacher. Where'd they get it? From the book. We only know of the love of God through the book. So there's reasons to love and learn from the book. Here's a second one. It gives me boundaries and guidelines that I need. There's a cliff here. One more step, you're going to fall into the abyss. Warning sign. Man, the Bible at times will say, there's a warning, there's a boundary, there's a guideline. Be careful of this. Live this way. I would not know how to be a husband that really does a good job of loving my wife well if I wasn't reading this book. There have been so many times I read this book and I discover the guidelines, the boundaries, and how to love my wife because this book speaks to my heart. It calls me to be a servant and not to be selfish. Everything inside of me says me. And this book says, you love her first. As a matter of fact, this book tells me to love my wife and serve her and lay my life down like Jesus laid down his life for the church, for the lost. I'm to serve my wife that way. I wouldn't do that on my own, and I'd have no concept of that. But this book teaches me. 
Understand that this book gives us boundaries and guidelines. So in Proverbs 7, Proverbs 5, 6, and 7 deal with the issue of temptations in this world and enticements. And in Proverbs 7, there's, there's this amazing story of a young man who goes kind of the wrong place to the, the wrong time in the wrong setting, and a woman comes to entice him. And so listen to these words. Listen to this warning and these boundaries. Here's this person who actually is encountered by a married woman who's coming out to seduce him. And here's what you read. This woman comes and she says to this man, come, let's drink deeply of love till the morning. Let's enjoy ourselves with love. My husband is not at home. He's gone on a long journey. He took a purse full of money. He will not be home till the full moon. We won't get caught. He's out of town. With persuasive words, she led him astray. She had seduced him with her smooth talk. Now listen to this. All at once, he followed her. Like an ox going to the slaughter, like a deer stepping into a noose till an arrow pierces his liver, like a bird darting into a snare, little knowing it will cost him his life. In the Hebrew language, the way you made a point was you repeated it, and you repeated it, and you repeated it. Sometimes three times, maximum repetition. Before it got annoying, three times was the maximum intensity. And this says, you know, he says, you know, like an ox to the slaughter, like a deer in a noose, like a bird in a snare. Dead, dead, dead. Warning, cliff, don't go there. And our world says do anything you want with anyone you want, anytime you want. It's just, a, it's kind of a free, open, have a great time. And God says, you know what? It's not the best way to live. I love this book because it has saved my life and my marriage, and it saved me over and over and over. I don't know how to live the right way. I don't know all the boundaries, but God gives them. And you know what? He gives them with grace, but he gives them with clarity and firmness. Reasons to love and learn from the book. Number three, it tells me who I am and who you are. This book gives me my identity, and it tells me your value and your beauty. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, we read these words. So God created mankind, humanity, in his own image, in the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. This book tells us that you are made in the image of the living God, and so am I. We may choose to receive Jesus, we may not. But every person you meet today has been made in the image of God. How do you know that? This book tells us. Every person's valuable. How do you know that? This book tells us. Even your enemy deserves love. What? Yeah, that's what this book tells us. Makes no sense to me. Probably doesn't make much sense to you. But it made sense to Jesus. We were his enemies. And he loved us and laid his life down for us. He forgave us when we didn't deserve, us, deserve it. And he calls us to forgive each other. Man, this book challenges us. It, it, it guides us. It directs It shows us who we are and who the people around us are. We are beloved people of God and made in his image. Reasons to love and learn from the book. Number four, it gives me hope and power in the hard times of life. Man, when I'm weary, when I'm tired, when times are tough, I cannot tell you how many times reading this book has put me on the right path. Maybe for some of you right now, with all that's happening in our world, from, from COVID and sicknesses and fears and a new cycle of what's going wrong in the world to economic challenges. And some of you maybe are, are saying, I don't know if I'm going to even go back to my job, if it's going to be there. Or maybe you know it's gone already and you're struggling and there's heartache there. And, and, you, and you say, I just don't have hope or strength to press on. With all that's happening in our nation, with conflicts and riots and, 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 and tension, and it just seems like that it's just things could just Keep, keep tearing apart. And you say, man, I am so discouraged. I'm so down. And you know, sometimes what you need to do is just sit down and open this book and say, and say God, what do you have to say to me? What do you want to teach me? And, and there, there's a passage that's familiar to many, but I'm going to just read this to you and ask you just to listen to these words from Psalm 23. In those moments, just sit somewhere quiet, open the book, and read something like this. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. 
He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the darkest valley, whatever the dark valley is right now, a societal valley, a a relational valley, a financial valley, a health valley, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. They protect me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Man, do you need comfort? Do you need hope? Do you need some light in the dark times? Open the book, and you will fall in love with it. And for some of you listening, some of you, you could come right now and give testimony. Oh, in my dark time, it was this psalm, it was that psalm, it was this teaching of Jesus, it was these words of the Apostle Paul. It was this beautiful portion of, of Proverbs that gave me the wisdom I needed. But, but hold to God's word, fall in love with God's word, and know that he gives you hope and comfort and strength as he leads you forward. And then one last reason, to love and learn from the book. It shows me the path of salvation. What must I do to be saved? In this crazy world where there's all, all these things you have to do to measure up, God says, just come to me as you are and receive me. In in John 1, verses 12 and 13, we read this. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his, this is Jesus, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of a natural descent or of human decision or of a husband's will, but born of God. This book shows me that the way to salvation is found in Jesus Christ, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. In the book of Romans, chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, we read this. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. It is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. How do I know I'm saved? How do I know that God has opened his heart and the doors of heaven to me? This book shows us through Jesus Christ, by his grace and his love and his mercy, if we'll receive his work on the cross, the payment he paid for our sins, and take his hand and walk with him through this life and forevermore. He'll never let go. He will never let go of your hand. We would not know this if it were not for the word of God. God's word leads us into the truth and shows us who Jesus is. So here's my encouragement. Here's my challenge. That you would treat the book like you love it. Treat this book with care and with tenderness. I don't just mean be careful how you handle it. I mean, as often as you can, pour the truth of this book into your heart, into your mind, into your life. Let God just bring his word alive in you. And then walk with him and follow him. I began by reading a portion of Psalm 119. I want to finish by reading those same verses. And ask yourself, does this reflect your heart or could this reflect your heart if you were to say, God, grow my love for your written word. Psalm 119, beginning in verse 97. Oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it all day long. Your commands are always with me. And they make me wiser than my enemies. I have more insight than all my teachers, for I meditate on your statutes, on your word. I have more understanding than than the elders, for I obey your precepts. I have kept my feet from every evil path, so so that I might obey your word. 
I have not departed from your laws, for you yourself have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. I gain understanding from your precepts, therefore I hate every wrong path. And you know why you can hate a wrong path? You know the word? Because it shows you the right paths. So I want to live this way as I love people, not this way as I'm bitter towards people. I want to live this way as I forgive and not the path of unforgiveness and bitterness. This book not only shows us how to live, it shows us how not to live. So here's my encouragement for you. On our Shoreline app and on our website, we have three new ways to study the Bible. We kept the three from last week. We've added three more to it. Explore new ways of studying and reading the Bible, listening to the Bible, uh, reading scriptures out in creation, being actively involved in doing something else while you're listening to God's word. We're going to keep giving you a bunch of creative ways to get God's word in your mind and in your heart. Try some different things. If you're kind of like, well, I always do it like this. Well, maybe it's become a little bit dry and there's some new things you can try. I want to also challenge you. If you don't have a Bible and you want a modern English language Bible, the same one that we use here at Shoreline Church, It's called the New International Version. If you want a copy of that, you just text the word Bible to the number you see on the screen right now, and we will send that to you, believing that you're going to read it, and God's going to do great things in your heart and your life as you feed and feast on his word. Oh, how I love your word. Lord Jesus, let that be our prayer, that we would know that this is the book, Jesus, that you love, that you've given it to us, And Lord, help us grow to love your word. Let people look at us and just like we we lavish a pet with love and just like we lavish ourselves sometimes with snacks and just like we might have a hobby and we lavish ourselves with pursuing that hobby, may people look and say, oh man, she loves God's word. He believes in the word. He loves the word. God, we don't worship the Bible. We worship only you. But you and your word tell us to love your word and to love it with all of our hearts. Let us so love you that we long for your word and let your word transform us and make us who you would have us be. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Well, I just have one announcement for you today, and that is we're going to meet again next week to worship. Three services online, 8.30, 10, 11.30. If that serves you best, stay online for now. That's totally fine. If the weather allows, we will be also registering again for two services, 9.30, 11.30 in the courtyard. We're keeping it outside. Go on our website for all the details, all the guidelines, how to register, and then we'll give you an update there. God bless you, and we'll see you next week, either online or on campus. God bless you.